In many places, governments charge sales tax on retail purchases. There are numerous exceptions, notably purchases of food. Suppose you're at the grocery store and buy three tubes of toothpaste for $4.99 each, and six big cans of beans for $1.25 each. The total charge will include taxes on the toothpaste subtotal, here using 6.5% as an example, but not on the beans. The total for this purchase is $23.44, including the tax on the toothpaste portion. Let's explore the Python code that can do this calculation using a for range loop, a list of sales data, and conditionals. The variables will be visualized to the right of the code, and the output will show up in the console beneath it. This first line of code uses square brackets and commas to make a list of data. For each type of item in a transaction, suppose it is represented by an integer quantity, followed by a float price, followed by a boolean representing if sales tax applies or not. Perhaps this is the way the data is returned from our inventory database. This list, stored in the sales variable, could represent any number of items sold in a transaction. In this example, there are 18 elements in the list, corresponding to six distinct items. We create a variable total in order to gather up the price from each set of items. This for range loop will repeat all the code from lines 6 to 12 outlined in gray. The loop variable is given a traditional name i, short for index. What values is i going to have? To answer that, Python first looks at the inputs to the range function and sees this len function call. Python needs to evaluate that first before it can evaluate the range. Len takes one input, something like a list, string, or dictionary, and counts up how much is in that thing. Because this is a list, len counts all the elements in the list and returns that as an integer. Python now has the actual values for all three of range's inputs. I call those three inputs start, stop, and step. The created range is effectively a list of numbers, starting at the start number, which is currently zero. Then it increments by the step, going up by three each time. And the stop parameter is what we call exclusive, meaning Python stops before it gets to that value. This means 18 is not in the list, and Python stops the range at 15. This list of numbers is what the loop variable i will step through, thus it starts at the beginning with zero. Python can now run the code in the loop. The variable name sales, followed by square brackets with i in it, means to use the zero from the i variable to extract the element at index zero from the sales list. This is the first element because Python starts counting at zero. This first element is then stored to the variable qty, short for quantity. The next line uses i plus one and square brackets to get the next element from sales at index one and saves it to the variable price. Then we use i plus two and square brackets to get the next next element from sales at index two and store it to the variable should tax. Now that we have the three pieces of data for this first set of items being purchased, we can now compute the combined price of these items using multiplication. The result of this is saved to yet another variable, subtotal. Only some of the items should be charged sales tax. To make Python execute code sometimes but not always is the role of this if statement. The condition is simply the should tax variable. If that variable is true, then we'll run the doubly indented line 11 outlined in blue. So we multiply subtotal by 0 0.065 to calculate 6.5% tax, and then add it to subtotal using the plus equals operator. That is the end of the if statement, and we arrive at the last line in the for loop, which adds the subtotal for this item to the overall total, again using the plus equals operator. We have reached the end of the loop, so we go back up to the top to advance the loop variable. The next value i steps to is 3, and the code in the loop runs for a second time. The qty variable gets the value from sales at index 3. The price variable gets the next value from sales at index 4. And the should tax variable gets the next next value at index 5. Multiplying quantity and price gives us the subtotal. Then the if statement looks at should tax to decide if line 11 should run or not. Should tax is false, so the indented line 11 is skipped, and we add subtotal to total and save it back to total using plus equals. The loop continues for the next value of i and the data corresponding to those items in the transaction. Because we need to get elements from the sales list three at a time, that is our list elements are dependent on their neighbors, the for range loop and square brackets are the right tools for the job. 
a for each loop would be a lot harder to use this way. The loop will now continue on. If you want to jump forward or backwards, use the chapter markings below. The loop finishes after the sixth item in the transaction, when Python gets to the end of the range. Before we display the result to the user, we want to round to two decimal places, since that is typical for American currency. Python's built-in round function has two inputs, the value to round and the number of decimal places. It will round the last digit up or down as appropriate, and return that rounded float, which we save back to the total variable. Before printing, we use the format string method to insert the total variable into this string. We want the float to go immediately after the dollar sign, so we put a pair of curly braces in the template string, and this acts as a placeholder, which is then replaced with the value of total that was passed in. Finally, we use the print function to display the formatted string to the user. This animation only showed the code working for six items in a transaction, but through the power of loops, it would just as easily have worked with 600. I encourage you to get practice writing code that uses loops so you can have the computer tirelessly solve your problems. Happy learning!